Good morning, Refuge. Really good to see you all. Uh, I got here late this morning. I overslept. Yeah. It's really, it's actually been kind of a struggle for me this year. Uh, uh, last year, I bought a Dallas Cowboy wake-up alarm. And uh, it quit working. So, you know, I thought I'd got it fixed. Uh, last week, knowing that that wasn't working, and, you know, it was the Ezekiel Elliott model. So I knew it was going to be down at least six weeks. So I went and got me a Texas Tech halftime alarm. Yeah, that one didn't work either. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's, it's great to be here, to be here with you, uh, to have the, the opportunity just to share the Word of God uh, in that. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Travis uh, last week, I guess, it might have been the week before last, anyway, just, uh, asked if I wanted to take a Sunday, and I was like, sure. And so we said that, so I went to the lectionary just to see what the text was, and as it would be, it is a hard text. Surprise, right? <laughs> We're going to be preaching, sharing today out of Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Uh, this, this text is the third parable, one of three parables, or the third of three parables that Jesus is sharing with the leaders of that day, the chief priests and the elders of the people. If we go back to chapter 21, we find Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding upon a donkey, the children declaring Hosanna to the king. He comes into the temple and he turns over the tables of the money changers. It says he disrupts the chairs of those who sold doves. He went back into the temple and the lame and the blind came to him and he healed them all. Verse, or chapter 21 verse 15 says, But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, the children shouting Hosanna in the temple. They were indignant. I tell you what, now just start here. We're going to just, just uh, kick off right here. Religious people, religious people, not to be confused with the people of God. Religious people do not like it when God moves in the presence of his people. You just need to know that. Best example I know of, I'm going to get back in the middle. Because I am just that way. How can he possibly sing off center? I'm like, dude, fix that. Okay, we're back in the middle. Okay. Woo! I can relax now. But it was getting bad because I was around going, this isn't balance. We're going to have to put these chairs over here. Had a friend who was in a church and a man died. He was pronounced uh, legally dead. He had no brain activity. But they had him on life support. I'm going to fix the cords while I talk. So y'all just, just do what you're doing. I'll do what I'm doing. Um, so anyway, he was uh, legally dead on life support. And the mother, who was a part of a church, uh, went to the pastor and said, Will you come and just speak over my son so that we can unplug him? Well, this pastor goes in there, doesn't know any better. And he says, God, if it's in your will, raise him to do the life. But if not, we surrender him into your... And the dude woke up. Woo! Came to life. Split the church down the middle. Because half the church says, God doesn't do that anymore. He did. When God moves amongst his people, religious people don't like it. You need to know that. Uh, he began, he, he goes, so after he, after he deals with the, these people, they, they confront him, he responds with scripture, and the Bible says he went back to Bethany and stayed the night. He returns the next morning, comes back to the temple, and once again, the leaders, the chief priests and all, they confront Christ again. Now, we're still in chapter 21. So again, they come and they confront Christ, and he asks them about John the Baptist, who's recently been killed. They don't like that. So they basically just retreat. Say, we don't know. And they retreat. 
And he begins with three parables. First parable, he talks about two sons. The father has two sons. He says, he tells one, go and do this. And the son I will, says, I will not. But later he does. The second son comes forward and he says, go and do this. And the second son says, I'll do it. But he doesn't. And he asks the chief priests and the Pharisees, which of these is the better son? They say, well, obviously, the one who said no, but repented and came back. You have answered right. Tells the second parable about a landowner. He planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, and leased it out and came to collect what was due him. They refused to pay. They killed his servants. They even killed his son. He said, what will this king do? He says he'll destroy them all and he'll lease this land out to one who will give him what's due him. Christ makes this statement. Chapter 21, verse 43. And this is just what's going to piss them off. I probably can't say that here, so <laughs> put your word, put Whoa. whatever word you need. We're almost done with straightening this out. Offends them greatly. Should have got that the first time, right? Sorry. <laughs> Jesus says, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce fruit. Taken away from you. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 21, verse 45 and 6. When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. Could have been the way he was pointing his finger at them. They knew he was talking about them. And they plotted and prepared to kill him. Because that's the way religious people... Now, when I say religious people, you got, I, got, I got good news and bad news. The good news is you ain't them. The bad news is you are them. We can become just like them. We can become them. Because religious people don't like it when God moves in their midst. Matthew 22 verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying Business. 
servants mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Let's stop right there. It is, it is absolutely accepted and understood that this portion of the text is in reference absolutely 100% to the Jewish culture, to the people that Christ had come through. Do you understand that? That this is a, a promise, or, or a, not a promise, but a, a invitation to the people, the, the Israeli country, that that promise that had been made to them would be taken from them and extended to another. Now, I've got good news in that. That's how we got in. That's how you and I actually received. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay, now I can breathe. There's a like, what? <laughs> um, that's how you and I gained access to the kingdom of God. Now, I don't believe that we were plan B. I believe that God foreknew, and Scripture tells us that. But the good news is that you and I were invited, that you and I were prompted, that you and I were called to be part of the kingdom of God. Verse 8, and he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and, in, and invite to the banquet anyone you find, whosoever will. So the servants went out into the street and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. <laughs> Just waiting to see who moves so I know who you invited. Both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Second part of this text. You, my friend, have been invited. You, my friend, good or bad. I don't care what the enemy has told you, and I know he tells you that because you come and you tell us, and you say, you just don't know how bad I was. Well, you know what the difference in your bad and my bad was? Is that I lied about doing the things that you did. And I was just as guilty as you was. The good and the bad. My brother recently, God bless his soul, he has passed away, but he never drank, smoked, or chewed, and never went with girls that do, you know? <laughs> I mean, he walked the line, he was saved, came to Christ as a very, very, very young teenage boy. I mean, he came to Christ and he walked it out and he constantly followed Jesus and he constantly did what was right. And he was a giver and he was one who, who took care of others. And he was that man, but he was just as bad as me and just as bad as you. Because his righteousness and his goodness was as filthy rags compared to the righteousness of Christ. Both good and bad. I don't care how you claim yourself. I don't care how you mark yourself. You are one of these. And you, my friend, have been invited to the banquet. Amen? Yeah. But here's the part we have struggles with. Ready? But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. <coughs> friend? How did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, send him to hell. We can read it the other way if you want. Tie him hand and foot. Throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He was speechless. Christ said, send him out. We struggle with that. What happened to whosoever will? What happened to all you have to do is come? What happened to, what happened to, what happened to? And we struggle. What if it does come to the point that it is required of you and I that we perform at a certain level? And that salvation suddenly becomes performance-based. I've got good news. It is not. I, just before we go any further, I need to tell you that. 
You will never be good enough to enter the kingdom. You will never be good enough to enter the kingdom. But you are good enough to enter the kingdom through Christ Jesus. I began to look through this, and I, I looked, I found a portion of Scripture, it's in Isaiah. I'm going to begin, it's Isaiah 61, verse 8. For I, the Lord, love justice, I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord, says Isaiah. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. For He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of righteousness. Do you understand that this is for you? Do you get it that this is for you? That he, Christ, came and he said, you know what? They're not good enough. The good and the bad, they're not good enough. Except that I robe them. Except that I cover them in garments of salvation. And robes of righteousness. Let's go back to the wedding feast. And you come and, and both the good and the bad. And if you want to, you can be the good and I'll be the bad. Of course, I know that you're the bad and I'm the good, but I'm just a nice guy and I'm willing to let you be the good, okay? Because that's the type of guy I am. But we come and we come together and you and I both the good and the bad. Yeah, I know. Everybody knows. Everybody knows that I'm the good and you're the bad. I just want you to know that. Everybody knows that. But, so we come and you and I come to the gate and there's something that's going to happen before we can enter in. Now, this wasn't exactly a tradition amongst the Jews. But it was a tradition amongst other cultures. And it was that when you arrived, when you came, when you got to the, to the wedding, there was appropriate dress. Many of the kings of, of Asia and the eastern parts of the world, they would actually have that set aside for the very purpose. So that when came in, we came in, everybody would be clothed correctly. Each of us would arrive and we would be given garments. So there was no distinction between us. We all had been invited and were worthy to be there. We had been invited by the king. Uh, the, the problem with this one man is that he came to the gate and they said, we have the robe for you. And he goes, no, I believe I'll wear this. I believe I'll wear my own robe of righteousness. <laughs> I don't. The kings, oh, that stuff, that's what the paupers are wearing. That's what the bad people are wearing. I believe I'll just wear this because I look good in it. <laughs> I'm sure that when he walked in, he went, Y'all notice who's different? Because I wore my robe. Nice, isn't it? I picked it up in New York. I was there for a play. When you and I began to think that our goodness. You know one of the happiest days of my life was when I found out that there was no goodness in me. And so I didn't have to pretend anymore. No goodness in me. You know a better thing? You can take this offensively. I know there's no goodness in you either. And my expectations of you are so low that you cannot offend me. Doesn't that sound rude? Yeah, but yeah, yes, but no. I, to be in my world, the hurdle that I set for you is a hurdle that I can jump over. It lays really, really, really close to the floor. Because I know there is no good in me except Christ manifested, except Christ revealed, except Christ supported. There is no good in me. So why would I expect you any different? I know that you and I put on the same robe. That we bear the same attraction. Christ in us. Put off 
your filthy robes. This isn't part of the text. If my people, that's you and I, who are called by my name, that's still us, will humble themselves and pray. Seek from my way. Seek, humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and turn from their ways. No, 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 no. Turn from their wicked ways. My people, my people, called by my name. That's us. My people, called by my name. Turn from their wicked ways. Because my people, called by my name, their ways are wicked. We have to get our hand, our head, our heart around that to understand that except through Christ, you and I, you and I, you and I will not enter into the kingdom. Still struggle, it says, going back to Isaiah, it says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in garments of salvation and arrayed me in robes of righteousness. But I move on down to Revelation. Now this, this really shook my tree, if you will. Revelation, let us rejoice and be glad. Give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has, been, has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. The righteous acts of the saints. What are the righteous acts of the saints? What is the righteous act for you and for I? Except that when we come to that door, when we come to that place of greeting, we put on His robe of righteousness. We put on His robe of salvation. Do you understand that that is the righteous act that you can accomplish? It's to put on the righteous acts. To actually step into His grace. I want to keep going. There's a portion I want to get to. And if I have to skip things, I will. Galatians chapter 3. Consider Abraham. He believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Amen? Abraham was the first Christian. He was the first who was saved by faith. He was the one who launched Christianity. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. That is you and I. Do you get that? That you are a child of Abraham. Well, all the promises, we're going to get to this, but the promises made to Abraham have been extended to you. Going back to what we looked at earlier, Christ said, I will take it from you and I will give it to another who will produce fruit. The promise that was extended, when they talk about the Abrahamic uh, covenant, they talk about the, you know, the, the Jew this and the Jew that, and I don't want to get into a religious debate, but the promises of Abraham have been extended to us. The promise that every place you set your foot will be yours. You may claim it. When we walked into the science spectrum, it's still the science spectrum, but we claimed it for the kingdom of God. We claimed it. Amen? When we get back home, when we back, get back in our place, it's a little bitty place. You may not remember that. We get home, it's going to be, this is so small. It's a little bitty place, but we're going to go in there and we're going to claim it for the kingdom. Because the word says that every place we put our foot it will be ours. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. That's us. And announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. To understand that, that blessing, the blessing of Abraham is extended to you and I. But I want to go back. I want to go back to Isaiah 61. <coughs> Because as I was reading through this and as I was preparing, I'm going to tell you that the presence of God became true and real because I began to consider what the promise of Abraham was. Isaiah 61, beginning at verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign God is on me. Isaiah speaking, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captive. The release from darkness for the prisoner. Can you accept that today? Yes. God the Father speaking these words to you. 
good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That's you, my friend. To proclaim freedom to the captive. That's you, my friend. To And release from darkness for the prisoner. That's you, my friend. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God. To comfort all who mourn. Can you be that person? Do you understand that He is talking to you? Whatever you're going through. Whatever your struggle is. Whatever that thing is that the enemy or life or just you. It may be you. Are allowing to consume you today. Comfort. For all who mourn. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. A garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. These are righteous acts that are being bestowed upon you today. These are righteous acts that God wants to speak into your heart today. He wants you to hear it and receive it. Let me back up to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to you. The day of vengeance of our God for you. To comfort you who mourn. To provide for you as you grieve in Zion. To bestow on you a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. You will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. You, my friend, you will be called. An oak of righteousness because of the promise that was given to Abraham has been extended to you when you walked in and you set your feet in the door and you put on that garment of salvation and that robe of righteousness. The promises of God were extended to you. They were extended to you before you walked through that door. But when you accepted that robe, you accepted the promises that come with it. And his promise for you is true and it is right. And we have let the enemy of God steal from us long enough. We, we, we make this mistake here at the refuge because we don't want to be judgmental or critical. And we kind of make it a passive, a passive salvation, if you will. You know what? Come to church, kind of say, yeah, okay, I get it. And we don't mess with you. We don't bother you anymore. But I'm going to tell you that the walk with Christ is bigger than that. And it is greater than that. And these are the things that should be demonstrated in you. It shouldn't be an apathetic walk. You, you should be wearing out everybody you know. I got a call this week from a lady. She says, I need to know about the refuge. And I said, what do you need to know? And she said, is it real? <laughs> well, uh, we had a fire and we had to move it, so I guess it was real. <laughs> I mean, if we hadn't had to move it, if we had a fire and didn't have to move it, then it probably wasn't real, right? I mean, that's how you know. Is it real? I said, let me tell you. Let me tell you what real looks like. And I began to share with her the things that God is doing amongst His people. The things that they're sharing with us, people are speaking back to us as God has began to empower them. God has began to walk with them. You know, you say, you say, um, I've been sober for, fill in the blank. You know what the better idea is? I got my first house. This is the first time I've ever paid off a car. I got back with my wife. I restored a relationship with my son, my daughter. I've held a job for three years. Now you may think those are just things, but I'm going to tell you something. Uh, somebody, somebody said this to me, and, and I, I, won't, I won't point out who, but it was kind of funny. It kind of caught me off guard. He said, yeah, but the difference in you and me is that you have things. And I said, what do you mean? He says, like, like you make your house payment every month. How do you do that? <laughs> you paid a car off. How did you do that? I never thought in that way. I never, even, I was like, everybody does that. Apparently not, right? There's something about you. You may not know this, but BC, before Christ, you know how many apartments I had? You take the time from I entered into adulthood and I found Christ, 
and divide it by three because that's how long it took them to kick me out. Anybody know that story? And suddenly when I found Christ, there's something that changed in me. And I showed up. They used to call me. I worked for the post office and they would call me. Um, I was supposed to be at work at four and they would call me around five o'clock. And this old guy, and he, I could hear him slobbering. He had a pipe and he slobbered, so, which was beautiful in the morning, right? So I could hear him slobbering over the phone and he'd say, Wallace, are you coming in today? And I would say, well, you woke me up. I might as well. <laughs> now, thank God for the union. They couldn't fire me, right? Wow, found Christ. Became a model employee, showed up 30 minutes early every day. So that I could drink coffee and visit with people as they came in. It was a life changing event for me. Not acts of righteousness, but the, the, the result of Christ coming in. Verse 4 they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Let me stop right there. Ancient ruins. Do you know how many times we've heard, well, my parents were divorced and her parents were divorced, so I guess we're just going to be divorced. They will rebuild ancient ruins ruins. My dad never had nothing, so I don't guess I will ever have anything. They will rebuild ancient ruins. I grew up without a dad, so I guess my kids will be okay without a dad. They will rebuild ancient ruins. They will restore places long devastated. Do you understand that you do not have to walk in the sin of your past anymore. You understand that Christ had freed you, has completely freed you from the generational curses that have plagued your life up to this point. You understand that when you receive Christ, you are free and free indeed. When you put on robes of righteousness, those robes of righteousness afford you this right. That you will rebuild the ancient ruins. That you will take back those things that have been devastated by the sins of your father. The sins of the father will visit to the third and the fourth generation. But the blessing of God will pass to a thousand generations. What do you want to pass to your kids? Do you want to pass the sins of your father? Or the blessing of God? I refuse... I refuse to walk in the lack of my dad and my grandfather and my great-grandfather because I have been redeemed. And in redeemed, I have received the righteous robes of my God. And with that, we are able to build, to restore. Now, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Pre-Christ, I took my eldest daughter and I set her on a path of ancient ruins. Because I was divorced. I was separated from my wife. And I set my daughter on a path of the same ancient ruins that I had walked in. They, you, will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Do you notice how it went from the third person to the second person? We're getting a little more personal here. You see, because now it's becoming yours. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. You will be called priest of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. And in their riches you will boast. There's something about once you receive, once you accept, once you, you actually embrace the promises made to you, life begins to change. 
Once you realize that the promise is yours, that the promise is yours, that the promise is yours, you're not hearing it yet, that the promise is yours, it's not for somebody else. It's not restricted from you. As a matter of fact, he's got it in your face. He's actually saying, will you take this? The promise is yours. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields. And vendors of vineyards. You will be called the priest of the Lord. Name ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations. And in their riches you will boast instead of their shame. My people will receive a double portion. Still talking about you. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. Do you understand? Do you believe? Do you accept the fact that he is talking about you? We, 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 you and I have so long accepted our plight. You know what? You're just a stupid alcoholic and you'll never be no more than that. The devil's a liar. He's lied to you for this long. You're a child of the king, robed in righteousness. Does that mean that you're not going to struggle? Don't be naive. Don't be naive. But you're a child of the king, robed in his righteousness. And he has made you some promises that he wants you to hear today. That he wants you to walk out. God speaking, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them, you, and make an everlasting covenant with them. In my faithfulness, I will reward you and make an everlasting covenant with you. Their descendants will be known amongst the nation and their offspring amongst the people. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. Is the refuge real? Yes. Are you real? Yes. Are you? Yes. Are you a child of the King? Yes. Are His promises made to you? Yes. Man, start acting like it. Amen. And that's, that's not to belittle any of you. That's, I mean, I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm saying it to say that we have been lied to long enough. You know, when I read this text and it talked about this person not having the right garments, I thought, well, maybe he showed up with shorts and flip-flops. <laughs> right? We got flip-flops here this morning. <laughs> he looked away. Pulls his feet back. I said, it's too cold, man. Your toes are going to freeze off. I began to think about those things that we lack that prevent us from, from being part of all that God has accomplished and all these things. We think, we think that we can because we don't fit in. You know what? I'm just, I'm just. And you fill in the blank. Verse 9. Excuse me, verse 10. Isaiah, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me. Man. This promise is for you. For he has clothed you. In garments of salvation. Arrayed you in robes of righteousness. As the bridegroom. Adorns his head like a priest. As a bride adorns herself. With her jewels. He. Our God and Father has adorned you. Has adorned you with garments of salvation. He has wrapped you up. He has enveloped you. He has completely consumed you with garments of salvation. And He has covered you with robes of righteousness. His righteousness. You see, one day it will come and our Lord will return. And the King will come to measure I heard, I heard a joke, and 
a guy gets to heaven and uh, uh, St. Peter's there and he says, okay, it's a point system. And what you need to do is you need to tell us your righteous things that you have done and uh, we'll assess points. And once you get to a hundred, you'll get in. And the guy said, well, uh, I was married to the same woman for 36 years. And St. Peter goes, whoa, that's good. That's two points. He said, have you met my wife? And St. Peter says, you're right. That's four. <laughs> that's four points. And what else? He said, well, I was a good dad and I supported my kids and all that they did. And St. Peter goes, well, that's, that's a good point. That's one, that's one. That gives you five. That's good. So what else? He said, well, I gave to the church and I, I helped with charity and worked in a soup kitchen um, and at a, a, a clothes closet. And there's about five or six things. And he says, okay, well, we'll give you five or six points. So he gives you 10 or 11. The guy began to think. He said, oh, well, this is going to take an act of God to get me in here. St. Peter said, 100 points, come on in. <laughs> he has adorned you with garments of salvation, the robes of righteousness. And he invites you to walk in the promises of God. Put on your robes of salvation. Your wedding garments. Love well. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's join hands across this room and pray together. Father God, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. We thank you, God. Your love for us was great, God, that you saw us when we were the bad. And Master, you rescued us. You invited us to be part of your kingdom, to be part of your family. God, today we ask that you would envelop us with the promises of your word. God, we would be engulfed by your righteous acts. That in that, God, you would be demonstrated. That it wouldn't be anything that we had done. God, it wouldn't even be uh, anything we could take credit for. We would have to back up and say, look what my God has done. That that would be our celebration. God, we would find you as our Lord. Not just our Savior. We do surrender. We surrender, God, to your will and your way. We accept your salvation today. But, God, we surrender to your lordship. That you may guide us. That you may lead us. That, God, we will be an active demonstration of your love in a dying world. We thank you, God, for the refuge. We thank you, God, that you were real in this place that you continue to embrace your people. We ask that you go with us, that you, Master, calls us to be the perfect example of your love. We ask it today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We ask it in the name of Jesus, your one and only begotten Son. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our soon-coming King. It's his name alone that we pray. God bless you all.